Mayor of the City of Stanton, I call the Stanton City Council Work Session for August 25th, 2022 at 5.15 to order. Uh, the first item, I'll accept a motion to appoint Kim Cormier as the um, acting clerk of council. Well, I had it at home. I can get Wayne. I move that we propose Kim Cormier as the acting clerk of council for the August 25th, 2022 meeting. I second. All right, there's a motion on the floor by um, Councillor Claffey and a second by Councillor Amy Darby. Any further discussion? I'm hearing none. Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Mayor Oates? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. The motion carries. All right. Thanks Thank for being here. Thank you. Thank Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. The next item. On August 23rd, 2022, I received a request from Councillor Mead to participate remotely in the August 25th, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a temporary medical condition that prevents her physical attendance at the meeting. I will now entertain a motion to allow Councillor Mead's remote participation in this meeting pursuant to Stanton City Council procedural memorandum number three. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Pursuant to Stanton City Council Procedural Memorandum Number 3, I move to allow Councilor Mead to remotely participate in the August 25th, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a temporary medical condition. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Mayor, I'll second. Councilor Darby has second. Any further questions? Any comments? Hearing none. Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. The motion carries. All right. Councillor Mead, will you please state the remote location from which you are participating? 342 Sherwood Avenue, Stanton. Can everyone on council as well as the audience hear Councillor Mead? Yes. yes. Alrighty. All right. Welcome. On August 23rd, 2022, I received a request from Councillor Dole to participate remotely in the August 25th, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a temporary medical condition that prevents her physical attendance at the meeting. I will now entertain a motion to allow Councillor Dole's remote participation in this meeting pursuant to Stanton City Council procedural memorandum number three. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Pursuant to Stanton City Council Procedural Memorandum Number 3, I move to allow Councilor Dull to remotely, remotely participate in the August 25th, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a temporary medical condition. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Mayor Oaks, I'll second. Councilor Amy Darby has second. Any further discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Motion carries. I, I don't think I was voting. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Ms. Mead? Aye. All right. All right. Councillor Dole, can you please state from the uh, remote location from which you are participating? 1003 East Beverly Street, Stanton. Can everyone on council as well as the audience here? Councillor Dole? Yes. Yes. All right. Welcome. All right. The next item is item number one, consideration of the work session and regular meeting agendas. I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Before we get to that. I'd like to make a motion uh, if in light of the interim city manager's absence tonight, I move that we amend the work session agenda to remove roll call. All right. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks, I'll second. Councilor Darby has second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Ms. Mead? 
Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Dahl? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. The motion carries. Now, Madam Mayor? Vice Mayor Robertson. I make a motion that we approve the work session as amended and the regular meeting agendas as printed. Right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second it. Councillor Steve Claffey is second. Any further discussion? I'm hearing none. Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Dahl? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Mead? Aye. The motion carries. All right. So that means item number five on the work session uh, will be eliminated. So you can mark that off. Right, our next item is an introduction of Middle River Regional Jail Superintendent Colonel Eric Young. Mr. Blair. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, tonight or this evening, we will hear from Superintendent Young, Colonel Young as well, and he will give you a brief overview of uh, himself a brief biography and answer any questions you may have for him concerning the Middle River Regional Jail. Where are you going to make Come on. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Eric Young. I am the new, newly appointed superintendent as of July 1. Uh, superintendent Newton retired, and I was appointed uh, as the new superintendent at the jail. Uh, I've been around a long time, uh, 31 years. As far as in public service, I started out at the Gus County Sheriff's Office in uh, 1991. I uh, worked as a jail officer in the old Gus County Jail. Went to the patrol division, worked the patrol division for uh, several years. Then uh, the sheriff uh, put me as the first school resource officer in Augusta County. So I implemented the first school resource officer program uh, in the area. Uh, where uh, I expanded it from one school resource officer to five uh, through grant funding. Uh, from there, the sheriff then appointed me as the assistant administrator to the old Augusta County Jail uh, in early, late 99, 2000, uh, where uh, I worked at the old Augusta County Jail and assisted in the uh, uh, design and opening of the new Middle River Regional Jail which opened in 2006, and I've been at the Middle River Regional Jail since 06, uh, and held the rank of captain, major, deputy superintendent, and now the superintendent. Uh, so I have about 21 years of jail administrative, uh, administration experience. Uh, I, I was there when we laid the first block, so I can pretty much tell you about anything you want to know about the, the jail itself. Um, I, you know, I don't, you know, I asked Leslie what sort of, what, uh, what would she wanted me to discuss. You know, I sort of just open it up, uh, as to questions that you all may have that you're interested in knowing. I know one of the, the big push, pushes that we've had over the past several years is the overcrowded conditions. And, uh, so in 2000, 2018, we had about 2000, or excuse me, 2000, 1,030 inmates in that facility. Uh, state rated capacity is 396, uh, double bunked, uh, you know, currently working on some uh, inmate population numbers. But if it's double bunked, we can house about 769 inmates. Uh, that's sort of the max for general population. So over the past three years, uh, we've worked tremendously hard with the local legislators, uh, city council, county board of supervisors uh, as part of the authority. And, uh, in addressing the number of inmates that the Department of Corrections has, uh, been housing in the local facility that sort of belong in the state facilities. So, uh, through, through, uh, letters to our legislators and, and, and them being persistent with the Department of Corrections, since January of this year, we've moved 440 inmates out of our facility into the Department of Corrections which now my count this afternoon was 650 inmates. Uh, look, right now, 
I know that the Code of Virginia says that the Department of Corrections is supposed to move those inmates within 60 days of their last sentencing date. Uh, that is, that's what the code says. What has happened over the years is it, it's been more of a 90 day window. Uh, so back, uh, back in January, of course, COVID had some, some influence on, on how we moved inmates. But back in January, we had about 276 inmates that were 90 plus days out of compliance. Since then, uh, the Department of Corrections has moved. We've moved two large groups of inmates. Uh, into into the uh, DOC, and then they've continued to move 10 to 15 inmates a week uh, since then. So uh, uh, that's helped uh, tremendously uh, with safety and security of the facility, uh, and, and 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 especially with you know the talk of of expansion and, and renovation. Um, you know, I think uh, if if the numbers can stay, you know, in in the 750s. Uh, you know, the, the, the need is, is not there. Uh, but, you know, as, as the numbers increase, you know, it's something we will continue to have to monitor and look at as, as we move forward. Um, so that's sort of a little bit about where we stand with our numbers. Um, you know, I, I see some familiar faces. I think some of you came down and, and took a tour of the facility back, I don't know, some time ago, uh, to sort of give you an idea of, of what we we're up against. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, our goal, uh, at the, at, at the jail is, you know, it, it's, it's the safety and security of the inmates and the safety and security and the safety of, of, of the staff too. So, you know, we, we continue to monitor those numbers as we see the numbers increasing, then we'll take steps, uh, whether we have to look to farm inmates out to other facilities or, you know, continue to, to pester the DOC about their intakes. But I think in time, what you'll see is you'll probably see uh, increase of number of inmates that are awaiting sentence versus the number of inmates that are sentenced. So, so you know, we'll just monitor that as we move forward. So. How's your staffing? Staffing. So, you know, we still struggle with staffing, uh, you know, uh, just like a lot of, a lot of uh, places. Uh, currently, we have 28 uh, positions available or open for jail officer, and I've got eight nursing positions. So, yeah, so, I mean, when we look at uh, what we need to operate the facility, you know, we still, I mean, we, we still lack about 10 to 15 staff to be truly where we would like to be. I know the state's given us some, some emergency positions because of the uh, number of inmates we've had. Uh, but uh, to, to, to cover the posts that are required to be covered, you know, we still lack that staff. So we, we, we still struggle to, to get those people in. So. That's okay. yeah. We're going to finish up. What's the status of work release program? And yeah, we, so we look forward to that. So April 11th, we uh, reopened our residential work release program. Uh, we continue to have our home electronic incarceration program where we have 25 inmates on our home electronic incarceration program, where of the 25, 21 of those individuals are currently holding a job. Uh, four of those individuals have been approved because of medical issues. Uh, to be on home electronic incarceration through the program. And then we have 15 that are on our residential work release program. So uh, we opened up a housing area of 24 beds April 11th. Uh, I would have thought, you know, uh, since opening it, uh, we would probably would have filled that space by, you know, July, uh, but we haven't. And I think a lot of that is because the amount of inmates that the Department of Correction has taken into the, into their system. So, you know, it gives us less inmates that meet the criteria. You have to be sentenced and, you, you know, you, there's certain crimes that, that, that you can't have to be on that program. So I think as we move forward, uh, I think that the, the program will continue to increase. And if we see an increased number that the courts are allowing to be on this program, we'll look to shift some housing and hopes to open up another uh, housing area. What's the rate of the HEM per day? You know? So it's $19 a day. How much are the inmates responsible for of that? Uh, they're responsible for the entire. The entire yeah, amount? Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Roberts, a couple questions. Um, was it your administration or whatever? Or, or have we seen an increase of how much jail 
is reimbursed per inmate? Or is it still that still consistent? It's still consistent. I mean, uh, July 1st, uh, the, the, uh, the legislation it, it talked about an increase in the state responsible, uh, 12 or the 60 plus days, uh, going from $8 a day to 12. Uh, and I think as of, um, let's see. So, sir, I reckon if you look at, out of the $27 million budget that we have, uh, 36% of our funding is from reimbursement for per diems from, for the inmates. Another question. Is there any possibility <clears throat> down the road that the city of Stanton or the jail will uh, have a relationship where we can get inmates that are out helping getting a per diem basis or whatever and helping with public works or whatever the case. Yeah, so you're talking about our inmate workforce program? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would love to bring that program back. I think it's a great program. You know, we had it for a number of years. It was a very successful program. I know, you know, in Stanton, Stanton utilized them. Waynesburg utilized them. That's County utilized them. The problem being, I don't have enough staff. You know, I can barely keep the, the post that I'm required to keep with the staff I have. If I had enough staff, I could look to bring that program back to the localities to, to assist. But I mean, you know, if, if it would take an, an additional three to four officers above sort of what I would need. So if I could get another 15, you know, 15 to 20 officers in the door and get them trained, then I could something you're interested. In. Oh yes, most definitely. I, you know, I've seen the benefit in that program. I think it's a great program. It's just that, you know, I, I can't stress my staff in the facility uh, where where my main focus should be in making sure that, that inmates are taken care of inside uh, first. We sure could have used them on July 6th when we hit that storm. So, so you did use them? Uh-huh. Well, I heard we had some. So, so I did send some inmates in to assist with that, that. that, that uh, cleanup. Uh, because I didn't see that was a tremendous oh. mess. <laughs> As you guys say. <laughs> Talk to me about the home incarceration program. Uh, how much does the equipment cost? And you said you had 25 people on that. Is that something you'd like to see expanded? Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's a it's a great program. We had we had talked with the Commonwealth attorneys, you know, back when the COVID first. Uh, you know, originated about, hey, is there any way we could expand the home electronic incarceration program just due to the fact to help with the numbers and, you know, if people had the virus. And so they were very open-minded in, in allowing that program to sort of expand. So they were approving people that maybe they wouldn't approve before. Uh, and so since then, you know, we have seen the courts really take a look at that program and, and and continue to place people in that program. So it cost us about $3.50 a day uh, for that individual to be on that program. Of course, there's a cost that the inmate pays uh, to be on that program. So the cost is sort of covered in their their, their daily fee. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if there again, the more inmates I have out, the more staff it takes me to, to, to cover. So, Currently, I have two staff members assigned to that division, uh, and that's 25 inmates and 15 inmates on residential work release program. That's about all they can handle. So, you know, as I increase it, I have to, I have to staff it. So, there again, it comes to staffing a lot of it. So, how much does the equipment cost per inmate? $3.50. Which is nothing. It, it really isn't considering the, the, the daily cost of, of housing somebody in the jail. Correct. Yeah. Do we have any inmates uh, farmed out at other? We do not. So we brought all of the inmates that we had farmed out back at the, you know, at, at the end of last year and the first this year, uh, June 6th. Okay. Uh, we had, I think, 18 or 19 that right. as of June 6th. So, so we, we had the space to bring those, those individuals back and, and we did. So we, we're not farming anybody out. Good. Yep. Do you? Do you have any um, incentive or bonuses going to staff to try to get more people to come in the door? So the comp board just increased the start salary for jail officers to $42,000, uh, which was uh, start salary July 1 was $36,842. Uh, it's now currently forty two. 
Uh, and so uh, that that's been a we were hoping to see some some increase in, in applications, but we haven't. Uh, you know, we've gone out to, to the local uh, technical schools, uh, hoping to get some younger individuals, you know, that are interested in criminal justice. Uh, but no, we're just you just you're just not seeing a whole lot of interest in 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 in, in the correctional field, the jail officer field. So, you know, I think it comes down to uh, being a jail officer. You have to be a people person. You have to know how to. I mean, it's sort of like the law enforcement. You have to be able to talk to people. You have to have good common sense. You know that. You know what people. You know a lot of people. These these individuals that that, that I have that I'm holding. They've, they're, they're there while they're either waiting their sentence or they're transferred into the DOC. So, you know, it's, we have, it's our job to make sure they're safe, secure, make sure they're getting the med- medical health, the medical, their mental health need, you know, needs covered. Uh, and so, you know, if, if people can come in and have a, you know, just have an open mind, a lot of times that's, that's a big part of it. Are there any additional questions? Is, is the backlog coming down as far as the number of people that are in jail awaiting coming to jury trial, et cetera? So, all right, just ask that question again. So I'm trying to. The holding period before they get sentenced and everything's determined. Have we caught up in the court backlog and has that relieved your pressure? You know, I, I don't, I can't answer that question. Probably, uh, honestly, because, you know, I think, I think the backlog in circuit courts was fairly large. And, you know, I think some of the, some of, uh, law enforcement say that, that, uh, that is start, we're starting to see that they're getting more individuals into the courtroom. Uh, so, uh, but for me to answer that, I, I can't tell you right off the bat right now is, is what, where it is, where it's at. I know we have, in the past, we've had some some inmates that have sat down there at the jail for extended periods of time uh, that should, you know, in my, in my eyes, should have been seen by the court in a more timely manner. Right. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned um, staffing's an issue. Are you able to provide the mental health services that the inmates that needed um, critical? Yeah, you know, I have to say that we were probably, in, in, in my mind, one of the better facilities throughout the state that has a, a very good relationship with the Valley Community Services Board. Uh, we have three and a half clinicians. I say half, but you know, it's a funding issue, but, uh, we have three clinicians, uh, in the building, uh, every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, we do mental health, uh, brief mental health screenings, uh, you know, upon intake. Uh, and so we have, uh, we just, they just, uh, we have in the building a reentry program through Valley Community Services Board that, uh, they have eight, uh, staff members out of Valley that are assisting individuals' mental health needs to go out in the community, finding housing, f- making sure they're getting their medical needs, their mental health needs. So that's been a very prosperous program. I've seen a lot of good statistics out of that. Uh, and so, yeah, I think, you know, we have, we have some of the more cutting edge, uh, mental health, um, uh, services, uh, but I still think we need more. I mean, I think, you know, I just think it's, it's, it's a, it's a situation that we continue need, need to grow that, that service to assure that these people are getting the right mental health services they need. Thank you. Um, any additional questions or comments? Right. Well, thank you, Superintendent Young. We All right, thank you. you being and here just and feel free to give me a call if you have yeah. a question. Uh, you know, just just call the jail and 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 I will I'll get back to you. Congratulations. All right. Well, well thank you. Yeah. All right, Tom. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good seeing. All right. That takes us to item three: a discussion of amendments to Stanton City Code regulations of open burning. Mr. Blair. Thank you, Mayor Oaks and Council. Um, first, I'd like to thank Fire Marshal Weller for being here tonight. He's put a lot of work into this, but before he begins his uh, kind of walkthrough of the major proposed changes, I think it's worth pointing out this is a very, uh, a very quirky part of 
Virginia local government law in the sense that what we have to do tonight or, or this evening is fire marshal will go over some proposed changes. We're going to look for some head nods and, and see if there's a consensus to move forward. But this proposed ordinance has to go to the state air pollution control board. Um, you can't just adopt it as a council. The state air pollution control board would then review what's sent to them. And then if the board approves, it would come back to council and then council would need to vote for this as an ordinance or vote it down, up or down. But again, there's this, this is fairly unique in that you need to, to offer input tonight or this evening because this has to go to the state. But again, a problem with that is when the state approves it, if it comes back, we can't make any changes or if we made any amendments, we have to send it back to the state for their approval before we can approve it as a city. So with that, I will turn it over to the fire marshal. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Good evening. Um, so the basis is we've had a lot of complaints over the years. Um, it's been increasing over the years, just about uh, people doing open burning in their backyards. Um, seems from we've gone from uh, the past five years, five and a half years, 158 calls to investigate open burning. 110 of those have been unauthorized burns. What we consider unauthorized means they're either burning something they're not supposed to be or they're just not following what's in the ordinance. Um, a lot of, just based off of my experience, a lot of that has been just um, lack of knowledge of what our city ordinances are. Um, a lot of it's just how it's written. It's kind of hard to follow. So the whole purpose was to try to make it a little bit easier to understand the codes, um, what you can and can't do, and where you can do it. Um, so we're just going through basically updating a lot of the definitions to make it more clear of what can and cannot be burned, what the definition of garbage is. Um, you know, we don't allow the burning of any kind of refuge or garbage in the city because we have trash pickup available. Um, yet we still have people that have burn barrels and will burn their trash. So it's a little misconception of what they can and can't do. Um, again, a lot of it's just language cleanup, making it more clear as to what exactly is allowed and what's not allowed. The one biggest change is going to be of where it's allowed. Um, the proposed changes would eliminate open burning in residential and business areas. It would only be allowed in industrial areas for like, say, a new industry is coming in, they have to clear a bunch of trees off. But then again, there would be certain restrictions based on that where they'd have to use a pit, an incinerator to help reduce the amount of smoke and ashes that are produced. Um, also, uh, it would be allowed in an ag forestal district. So like the farms out on Bell's Lane or Dr. Herford's farm, they would still be allowed to do open burning to clear up some you know, um, what is now considered yard debris, but fallen trees, fence lines, and things like that. Um, that would change from a 90-day permit to an annual permit. So they would be able to renew. I know we have one current farm that has to renew every three months their burn permit. So this would just kind of streamline it. You would get the approval to have a permit, which would then be good for a term of 365 days um, instead of having to keep renewing. It would also reduce the cost for them. Right now they have to renew it every 90 days, which is $25. We would change the fee to a $50 fee for an annual permit. So therefore it's saving them money in the long run. Um, but then the commercial burning uh, would stay at $100 per the permit, and it, but it would only drop to 90 days. If they can't get what they need to get done in 90 days, they need to look at other options. Um, but so, I mean, those are just some of the major changes. Um, there's a lot of strike throughs in my version, um, but the main 
focus is just trying to make it more clear of what can and can't be done here in the city and then kind of making it a little bit more restrictive than what we've had to just kind of hopefully reduce the amount of complaints and responses that we have for open burning crew. Questions, Vice Mayor Roberts. What does an automobile graveyard have to do with open burning? Uh, a lot of times, not we haven't had this issue here, but sometimes they will uh, burn old tires. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't have that issue here. We have a very good relationship. You know, by conducting you know, fire inspections, uh, we can help educate them on what can and can't be done. But I know there have been other places. Just also some of the processes they do, considered uh, getting rid of old oil and stuff. So we just want to make it clear that. We're not going to allow any kind of party there. What about this, since this July 6th uh, storm wiped out a lot of trees and there's, you know, the, the tree has been removed, but the root system is still there. you got stumps. A lot of times people will burn the stumps. Is that going to be allowed forthcoming? It's currently a permitted event, but it would go away simply the fact that burning stumps is not as efficient as grinding the stumps. It's a lot cheaper. Correct. It is a lot cheaper, but again, we respond to a lot of complaints from people burning stumps because it takes time. Uh, it takes can take up to several days to weeks to get the, the whole root system burned. Um, so we've also had one individual float the idea that he wanted to place explosives in the stumps and blow them out of the ground. Okay. So, um, I think that's what that storm did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I understand where the concern is with that. However, it's just, it's in the residential areas, that's where we have a lot of our complaints, and we're just trying to reduce the, that. Um, based off my experience with it, it most people end up grinding the stumps up anyway because they just, it doesn't burn as well as they think it's going to burn. So is this uh, not only uh, complaint-driven, but a safety issue as far as you're concerned, as far as safety with uh, the fire getting out of control? Correct. Yeah, it, it increases some of the distances from occupied dwellings um, to give it a little bit more of a safeguard. Um, some of the complaints we deal with are about ashes falling on other people's houses and cars and whatnot. So by increasing the distances, hopefully that eliminates some of that. However, we have found that due to air currents and whatnot, sometimes the ash can travel up to a half mile. So we're not going to be able to always eliminate it. Um, however, when you have people burning in their backyard and ash, because they can't control the wind, goes somewhere, and then we have to deal with how do we handle ash falling on somebody's vehicle? Is it damaged? Is it not damaged? And then there's a whole, you know, civil liabilities come in versus we allowed it to happen. So it's just trying to help us better handle the situation and put more of a buffer around that area's member. Leads are not a question. When you get a complaint, walk me through the process of how you all deal with that. Um, if it's when a complaint is received, whether it's received by the dispatch center or if it comes into the fire station, we'll send a, a fire engine out. A lot of it depends on what the information is told. If it, they say if it's threatening the building or something, then obviously we're going to send a full structural fire assignment with two two fire engines, a ladder truck, and, and the rescue squad. Um, which yeah, it seems like overkill for something like that, but we just don't know based on your information. Um, however, a lot of times they just say, "Hey, my neighbor's burning in the backyard. Smoke's coming over." We'll send a fire engine out, non-emergency. They'll go out to investigate it, see if it's allowed or not. A lot of times, what we find it's just a a per, not a permitted, a permissible fire pit, somebody that bought that loads, that has a screen on it. It just so happens that it's producing a lot of smoke and it's blowing on some of it. Uh, but if it is a violation, a lot of times they'll give advice, give them a verbal warning, let them know what they're doing is incorrect, and then I'll do some follow-up just to make sure they're understanding of what the city regulations are. And then after that, if it's a repeat, then obviously we have other avenues with Issuing uh, just a, a notice, what a notice of violation under the fire prevention code, or if it's egregious enough, we can actually issue a summons. But thank goodness we've never had to do that. Most times, just through education, we typically handle it. I know we talked. You talked about you know uh, ashes, or whatever, floating on somebody's car. In in the history of Stanton, as far as you know, or at least you know, 
has there been any fires started from people burning? I mean, ashes actually starting a fire elsewhere. Not from the ashes. We've had a cool spread along the ground, you know, through just tall grass and whatnot, but not through actual ash. Okay. Typically, the ash will be cool by the time it falls back to the ground. Okay. Especially if it's got to travel a little bit of a distance. And with fall coming up, leaves are not permitted. Correct. Since we, we cannot burn leaves. <laughs> right. Since our public works uh, graciously allows leaf pickup, yes. we do not allow leaves to be burned because that does produce a lot of smoke. And a lot of issues we have is like people who move from the county to the city don't understand what our regulations are. So that's, again, it's an educational thing. Hey, you can't do that type of activity here in the city. And they, a lot of them are even aware that we do have to pick up. Again, um, this request is it's a safety issue. Correct. Um, coming from you as our fire marshal. Um, okay. Were there any other? Yes, this is Carolyn Dahl. <sighs> Are any of the changes affecting the general uh, regulations we already have apply, that apply to fire pits? Because I know they've just blossomed in popularity over the last, you know, five or so years. Um, and so are any of these changes going to affect directly the fire pit um, folks? <laughs> no, man. Under our current, current, uh, regulations it's considered a recreational fire um which we do have some regulation in it but being a lot of times that it's a single family dwelling it's one of the exemptions under the fire code and it's specifically identified in uh the city city code that it's a um permissible event depending on what they are burning if they're burning two by fours and plywood, then obviously that's not allowed. But if they're just burning solid wood to have a evening around a fire, um, then it's, it's allowed. Now there are some safety guidelines that we try to make sure that it's not right up against a, a, a home and that they typically would have a screen of some type over to help keep the embers from spreading. But it, it's not really going to affect that. There's really no major changes to that. And then one final question is when uh, the pollution board, air pollution board, uh, uh, sends it back and it's approved on their end, uh, I'm assuming and I hope that we'll do a kind of an education uh, piece, publicity uh, on our Facebook uh, and the city website or whatever, just uh, highlighting the changes so that uh, citizens can be aware of uh the, the significant changes uh, in the in the codes. So I'm hoping we're going to do that, right? Yes, ma'am. That that's my intent. Um, I do have some contacts in the media, so I'll probably reach out to them also just to see if they would be interested in running the story, since there are some pretty significant changes. Yeah, yeah. All right, thanks. We're not going to touch our s'mores, right? Right. All right. All right. Are there any additional questions or comments? Well, thank you. Uh, well, no, first we need to find out from the council. Um, do you guys have an interest to move this forward to the state? I think, I, think, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I get it from a safety standpoint. I guess the part that's giving me a little bit of heartburn is we're going from something that is allowing citizens to get permits to do to saying they're – that's not even going to be allowed, correct? Not in a residential area. If you read what our current standard is, it says it's not supposed to be allowed within 300 feet of an occupied dwelling unless you get permission from the people in those occupants. So you're facing that you're allowed by being in the good graces of your neighbors saying, yeah, I'm good with it until you're not. the smoke comes over and then it's intruding upon them, then they're not good with it. So this is just a you know, way to kind of streamline and try to make most everybody happy based off what conversations I've had with individuals. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you. I hear what our fire marshal was saying, but 
I, I think that, you know, folks, I like the fact that folks can get a permit and follow the rules and, and do that. I think we're putting them at a disservice to say in residential areas, that's not going to be allowed, period. So um, that's just my opinion on the situation. Councillor Dole, Councillor Mead, do you have any uh, thoughts? I support the fire marshal. Yes, I do too. And, and it's going to come back to us for a vote. So, uh, you know, maybe we could get some input. Why, would we need a public hearing on this? I don't believe you need a public hearing for this by statute, but certainly if the council wished to have a public hearing, you could have a public hearing before the vote. Yeah, because I, I think we should move forward and 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 wait till we get it back from the police the uh, police the pollution board and um uh, and then and then take a, a look at it at that point and see uh you know get input from the citizens and and uh vote on it then. Curry, how is this how does this compare to other cities around? The the language in it um is pretty considered these Virginia administrative code has um, I guess sample language for us to pull from so we've taken a lot of that and put it in there um, the only thing that we've really changed is the distances to where it's allowed where it's not allowed and um, just really going a step further and restricting it from the residential areas um, there's some other localities don't that don't allow it at all um, it's just a, a myriad of different um, codes you'll find throughout the Commonwealth. Um, so most everybody allows the recreational fire pits, um, or campfires, for lack of a better term, uh, just some places just don't want you burning in anything at all in a residential area. So it's, I would say we're pretty consistent with most of the other localities. Um, Again, it's just all and up to what each locality and how restrictive they want to be with it. Did I answer your question? So are you saying when we, if this was to be passed and the uh, pollution people were to come back and say this is fine, would we be in the more restrictive category or the more tolerable? I would say we're moving to the more restrictive Is it going to make the city safer? So um, I support taking it to the state and let them yeah, take let a them look at it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Blair, I believe you have your head nod. Thank you. <laughs> the majority says to please take it to the state. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Carrie, okay. for I'm all available anytime people. you might have any other questions about it or anything. We appreciate all the work that you put into this. So thank you. Thanks. Okay, well, we're now on break until 6.35. No, excuse me, 6.15. Uh, we have item number four, so we're on break until 6.15. Um, is it possible we can move on? Or do we? We, we could, if, if the council, well, I think Ms. Dole. Oh, did she just, okay, never mind. All right. She's there. Oh. She's there. Okay. Councillor Dole, Councillor Mead, are y'all okay if we keep moving um, through and go ahead and get item number four discussed and then we can go on a break? I'm fine with it. Okay. All right. So the next item is item four, a discussion of a public hearing on city's 2023 legislative priorities. Mr. Blair. Thank you, Mayor Oaks and Council. Um, <clears throat> Before we get to the substance of this, I just wanted to kind of go over procedurally um, the legislative agenda for this year. And um, one change that's been made is Ms. Beauregard, who had been handling it in years past, has asked the city attorney's office to handle it. Um, so I went back and looked at sort of timelines in the past. And it appears that the typical practice is that in a meeting in October, 
the council reviews the legislative agenda. Then typically either the second meeting in October or the, first, or the meeting in November, the council approves the legislative agenda. And then you typically have your meeting with legislators in December as part of your council meeting. So given that that's, uh, you know, in terms of calendar logistics, um, again, it's, it's our hope that either the first or second meeting in October will have an item in a work session to discuss the legislative agenda, the November meeting to have you vote on it, and then December to discuss with legislators. Um, given that, I have, uh, I sent an email, I guess, a couple of weeks ago to department directors and ask them, is there any specific bill um, that you would like to see this year as part of the legislative agenda? Um, one bill that I do anticipate will have for your consideration is um, there's an issue with unclaimed dead bodies, and we do, uh, Captain Brown can attest to this, we we have a few in the city every year. Um, there's a provision in the state code that allows us to ask uh, for bank accounts, uh, information about bank accounts, if there are expenses that can be covered by the decedent, but other accounts are not mentioned in the code. And so this past year, we've run up against some issues where financial institutions, and they're not the wrong based on how the code's written, or, or sort of like we can't give you access and let you know whether there are any assets available. So again, working with the police department, we'll probably have a staff request for a bill. Um, but I would like, if it's possible, by the end of September, if city councilors can email me if there's anything specific you'd like to see in the legislative agenda so that, again, we'll have it prepared in October for the work session. And then Ms. Mead, her proposal, and I'll let her discuss it, I think, is to have at one of our meetings in September a um, public hearing where citizens could bring up if they had a specific item that they wish to have the council consider for the legislative agenda. Uh, but I would turn it over to Councillor Mead if she'd like to discuss that in more depth. Thank you. Um, can you tell me when the VML meeting is? October 6th. Yeah. I'm sorry, when? Let's see. It's the, hold on a second. Second through the fourth. I believe it's, yes, the first weekend in October. Okay. Uh, October uh, second through four. Yeah. It's uh, tip, typically at that meeting, um, a lot of time is spent uh, discussing legislative priorities, and I believe it would be uh, uh, useful to have that information before the city develops its uh, legislative priorities. And I also believe that there are enough issues uh, that that uh, may be coming forward in January. I believe John Boley has already mentioned that um, that uh, that he is going to support an opposition to women's reproductive rights. And I believe that uh, our citizens should have the opportunity to weigh in on that issue and on any other issue that they feel is important so that we can let Mr. Avoli know how the people of Stanton feel about women's reproductive rights, for instance. So, Councilor uh, this is Carol Adol. Uh, my question is, with a public hearing or getting public input, could we do that earlier? Because we don't have to have our whole legislative uh, program signed, sealed, delivered, we could hear from them on anything, and we may want to include some things or, or not, or, you know, discuss them. So, you know, just uh, in the interest of not firming it up, because I, I think it is important to have VML, um, the, the committee, the legislative committee's recommendations. I know that my 
uh, Community Development <clears throat> and uh, Economic Development Committee. We've done ours. I mean, I've seen that, that one because I'm on that committee, but uh, it'll all get translated into the VML legislative program. But we could have the public hearing before we had the VML information. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Chancellor Mead, were you looking to have the public hearing uh, before the VML conference or after? Um, well, uh, I think it's important that the public understand what city council is proposing as legislative priorities uh, as part of the process. And I also want to mention that um, Councillor Dahl has sent information a couple of times about the possibility of implementing a single-use bag tax uh, that uh, the cities of Charlottesville and Fredericksburg have uh, begun to implement those. I'd like to hear from the citizens as well on that issue uh, to see if they would support uh, implementing a single-use bag tax in Stanton. Okay. I, I don't. Uh, I, I think. I think it's important that we hear from BML and uh, and get their advice on uh, what they believe is going to be important so that we can share that with citizens and then include any additional concerns that citizens might have. Yeah, this is Carolyn Dole. I, I think the only thing that I was worried about is that uh, you're not going to get anything from our representatives by January. It's too late. So, so all of this has to happen by the first meeting in December. And I, I, it's just a timing thing. I don't know. If, I don't know how that's going to work out, but I support it. But I just don't that we would be finalized in time to have it finalized before we have a public uh, hearing on it. I don't know that I mean that it should be finalized. I think it's an, it's fine to use uh, what is proposed uh, by city council to be our legislative priorities and what we share with citizens. I mean, I think we can, and then <clears throat> citizens also have the opportunity to weigh in on those things and add additional items if they feel that they're important as well. I understand the timing is tight. Uh, we've, uh, uh, and it's compressed further by the fact that we only have one meeting in November and one meeting in December. Uh, but, uh, but I, I do believe that it's impossible, that it is possible to fit this in if if we are if we feel it's important. This is Carolyn Dull again. Is, is it possible for us mm -hmm. to get from VML like the um, like like my uh, committee has already uh, come up with our wishes to have in the legislative program. So could we get the preliminary ones from the various committees or from the legislative committee? What, what they have on hand and because VML staff have already got some issues on the horizons that they would want us to include. And we could at least have that much data that we could be looking at now. Okay. I, asked, I think that's uh, a great idea. I asked Mr. Kessler to please get a, uh, a draft copy from VML uh, because I know we end up getting um, a draft copy when we check into VML, but I was asking if we could um, have one sooner than later. And so uh, they, uh, VML is working on that to get us a copy of it, of all the proposals. Uh, Mr. Blair. Well, let, let me ask this. Um, given the, the timeline, uh, looking at this, um, I'm looking at the calendar, perhaps – we could have a work session October the 27th, and that evening, and again, the, the, the proposal will be public with the agenda packet for that. And that evening, if citizens want to offer anything that they wish to see in the package, they can, and then again, you would vote in – on November the uh, eighth or, or the tenth, on the package. That makes sense. Well, we would be 
Yeah, we would have had, we would have gotten the VML stuff by then, and yep. we would have citizen, uh, the, the council individuals, uh, uh, wishes to have things put in or taken out or whatever. So we, it should be pretty much in, uh, kind of formal, it, it would be in form. It wouldn't be approved or anything, but, um, uh, so that, that might work. Council? Yeah, it's fine. Uh, fine. Yeah. Um, I'm good with it. So if you could um, set that up for So us. we'll we'll have the work session October 27th to discuss everything in a public hearing that night to ask the public for input and then vote November 8th on the final package. Sounds good. Sure. Thank you. All right, with that, we're now on break until 6.35. Thank you. All right, we're back from break, and at this time, I'll entertain a motion to go into a closed meeting. Yeah, Mayor. I move to enter a closed meeting pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A8 for consultation with legal counsel concerning contractual litigation and negotiation matters related to Stanton Circuit Court Case CL21-500 and Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A7 to consult with legal counsel pertaining to actual litigation in the matter of Stanton Circuit Court Case CL 21-500. There's a motion on the floor by Councillor Claffey. Is there a second? A uh, second. Vice Mayor Robertson is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Ms. Darby? Aye. Ms. Mead? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Dahl? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. The motion carries. All right, we're now in closed session. All right, I'll entertain a motion to come out of closed session. I move the council reconvene in an open meeting and certify to the best of each member's knowledge that only lawfully exempted public business matters were discussed and that only public business matters as identified in the closed meeting motion were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting. We have a motion on the floor by Councillor Claffey. Madam Mayor, I'll second. Okay. Vice Mayor Robertson is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Mr. Blair, please call the roll. Councillor Mead? Aye. Councillor Dole? Aye. Councillor Darby? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Councillor Claffey? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. All right. So this adjourns the work session for the Stanton City Council. We will... Come back at 7.30 for the uh, Stanton City Council regular meeting. Four minutes. 78 seconds. As mayor of the city of Stanton, I call the August 25th, 2022 Stanton City Council regular meeting to order at 7.30 p.m. And the first item is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would like, please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. The next item is the invocation moment of silence. And tonight uh, it is Councillor Carolyn Dole's turn. Councillor Dole. I would like to uh, have a moment of silence and for folks to uh, reflect on uh, several items. One is for us to continue to send our our uh, best wishes uh, to the Ukrainians, the, the people and, and their government for their strength and endurance, endurance in protecting democracy for the world. And that's what's going on there. And they are such strong people. Uh, they're a, they're a people to be admired. And then secondly, to, 
to uh, reflect on the fact that uh, women's rights uh, are being taken away from them throughout the United States. And this is a sad day for our country. Uh, and we should reflect on what it means to have a democracy and what rights humans deserve to have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. The next item is the mayor's report. And tonight I am honored to be able to read a proclamation for Will Reed and Langdon Reed. So if you can give me one second. City of Stanton, Virginia proclamation in recognition of Will Reed and Langdon Reed. Whereas Wilson Fairchild is a country music duo made up of Will and Langdon Reed, who have been writing, performing, and playing music together their whole lives. And whereas Will and Langdon come by their talents honestly, as Will is the son of the late Harold Reed and Langdon's dad is Don Reed, both of the legendary Statler brothers. And whereas these two cousins continue in the footsteps of their fathers not, a, not only on stage, but also by continuing the tradition of Stanton's unforgettable Independence Day celebration, first initiated by the Statler brothers more than 50 years ago. And whereas Will and Langdon, along with the stellar committee of enthusiastic community leaders, have resurrected the celebration offered years ago when the Statlers headlined the event and is today known as the Happy Birthday America. And whereas the goal of Happy Birthday America is celebrated America's birthday in the same family-oriented and wholesome tradition of food, fun, music, and fireworks that Stanton has come to love. And whereas in 2022, Happy Birthday America returned to Gypsy Hill Park for the first time since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic and was an immense success due to the efforts of our community and Stanton icons Will and Langdon Reed. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by Stanton City Council that the city of Stanton honors Will Reed and Langdon Reed, and the city recognizes with great appreciation the efforts of the entire Happy Birthday America Committee in organizing this patriotic event started by the city of Stanton and the Statler Brothers. As Harold and Don would say, it all began with a walk in the park. Adopted this 25th day of August, 2022, signed by Mayor W. Oaks. And, um, now I have more to read, so hold on one second. The key to the city of Stanton is a beloved symbol by civic recognition and gratitude reserved for individuals whose service to the public and the common good rises to the highest level of achievement. So, Will and Langdon, you're not only receiving a proclamation tonight, but you're also receiving the key to the city, which is the highest honor that anyone can be um, bestowed upon by the Stanton City Council. So if you could please come to the front and if my... Um Now, I'm going to ask that my um, fellow council members join me in front of the dais along with um, Will and Langdon's family, and we're going to get a few pictures. Then after that, if the Happy Birthday America Committee could join us for some pictures. About you, but I thought this had to do with parking tickets. <laughs> 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 uh, but this is much better. I did too, because Will said, Can you come to the city hall and bring your wallet with you? <laughs> 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 oh, thank you. Oh, very nice. Thank you so much. We'll take that up Bring in the crew. Back them and stack them. We're all just at Fort Bennett. Hurry up. Good. All right. How far back? It's like a limbo contest. Thank you, buddy. All right. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, America. 
I'll be out in the back. Yeah, I'll be out in the back. Yeah, I'll be out in the back. Yeah, I'll be out in the Not a good day to have the JV photographer in today. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thank you all. I So for what it's worth, um, all the years I've been on council, this is um, only the third time that we've uh, given the key to the city out to um, some very worthy citizens. So thank you very much for everything, Will and Langdon, that you have done for the city of Stanton. And thank you to the Happy Birthday America uh, Committee for, well, bringing back the patriotic um, festivities that Stanton has grown to love. And to um, your fathers, uh, we, um, we are in for eternal gratitude towards everything that they have done for the city of Stanton. So thank you. We look forward to next year. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. And you guys can stay if you'd like, or you can go. Um, so it's going to be a long meeting, so I've... Would probably suggest you know, going home and enjoying your key. <laughs> Try yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's the key to the um, Stanton's heart. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So the next item under the uh, mayor's report, I'm going to keep it simple. I attended a lot of different um, meetings and functions. Um, one I'll mention, I picked up trash in the West End again, so um, that um, has become a tradition for me every quarter. So if anyone's interested in ever picking up trash every quarter, the uh, West End Business Association, um, along with the West End Alliance, uh, pick up trash in the West End to help keep it, um, well, just looking pretty. So with that, are there any additional items by members of council? Uh, Councilor Claffey. Madam Mayor, I have a lengthy one here today. Uh, the nominations committee uh, met on August 3rd, 2022, and I just cut that off. And uh, I wanted to bring up two things. We have uh, uh, been interviewing people that were appointed on previous councils that we had never met, and we uh, had a wonderful interview with with numerous people on council uh, that are uh, working on various boards and commissions. And we, and we just wanted to know if there was anything we could do. And a lot of times we had never met these people before. And the interest that they express for Stanton and the enthusiasm they show for their boards and commissions was to be, you know, commended. It was a great, it was a great adventure for us. So, uh, we had a, um, interesting time. And we're going to try to continue to do that so that we come to know all the people that are working on our boards and commissions. And we have a lengthy list of reappointments that I'm desperately trying to get up here. And here it is. We would like to appoint John Breyer to the Recreation Advisory Commission for a three-year term beginning September 1, 2022, ending August 31st, 2025. To appoint Tara Herbert to the Recreation Advisory Commission for a three-year term beginning September 1, 2022, ending August 31st, 2025. To reappoint Judy Bertner to the Social Services Advisory Board for a four-year term beginning September 1, 2022, and ending August 31st, 2026. To reappoint Judy Bertner to the Community Action Partnership of Stanton, Augusta, Waynesboro, Capsall for a two-year term, beginning September 1, ending August 31st, 2024, 
to reappoint Rebecca Harmon to the Landscape Advisory Board for a three-year term beginning September 1, 2022, ending August 31st, 2025, to reappoint Fred Blanton to the Lewis Creek Watership Advisory Committee for a three-year term beginning September 1, 2022, and ending August 31st, 2025, to reappoint Deneen Brannick to the Historic Preservation Commission for a three-year term beginning September 1, 2022, and ending August 31, 2025, to reappoint Anna Levitt to the Valley Community Service Board for a three-year term beginning September 1, 2022, and ending August 31st, 2025, to reappoint Mary Jo Corian to the Lewis Creek Watershed Advisory Committee for a three-year term beginning September 1, 2022, and ending August 31st, 2025, and to reappoint Sarah Holberg to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee for a two-year term beginning September 1, 2022, and ending August 31st, 2024. Okay, so that's in a form of a motion? Yes. All right. Um, Since it's coming from a committee, we do not need a second. Um, Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Ms. Mead? Aye. Mr. Holmes? Sorry. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Stahl? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. All right, thank you. Um, One further thing, we we have updated uh, the boards and commissions. We have some needs. I would urge all citizens to uh, look into the matter, and maybe there's some some board or commission you would be interested in serving on, and we, we have some immediate needs particularly on the Valley Community Service Board. Thank you. All right. Are there any additional items by members of council? All right. Hearing none, I'll um, entertain a motion for the approval of minutes for the work session and regular meeting of July 28th, 2022. Madam Mayor, I make a, I make a motion that we approve minutes as printed for the July 28th, uh, 2022 work session and regular business meeting. All right. There's a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Robertson. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks, I'll second. There's a second by Councillor Amy Darby. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Dahl? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Classy. Aye. The motion. All right, thank you. That takes us on to the regular meeting, and our first item is item A, a public hearing and consideration of a request by Stanton, Augusta, Waynesboro Habitat for Humanity for a special use permit at 951 Anderson Street. Mr. Blair. Thank you, Mayor Oaks. Uh, Rodney Rhodes, the city's senior planner, will be presenting this item. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Mayor, city council members. Stanton Augusta Waynesboro Habitat for Humanity has requested a special use permit for living quarters on the ground floor of a structure to be constructed at 951 Anderson, Anderson Street. The property is owned B1 local business district and living and sleeping quarters on the ground and basement levels is only permitted by special use permit. Uh, to staff's knowledge, this property has always been used for residential purposes. Uh, the last house that was on there was demolished in 2012. Um, and now um, uh, Habitat uh, wishes to build a new sh- house on it, a two-story structure on this 33-foot uh, wide lot. The proposal uh, proposed structure is 20 feet wide. Um, sorry, losing my place here. That's okay. um, the B1 district, which uh, you know, is a commercial district, does not have established setbacks for residential structures. Um, however, staff proposes that minimum setbacks be established as a condition of approval, and staff recommends using the small lot exception for residential districts as a guide and set minimum front setback of 15 feet or the average setback established by the existing dwellings on the street and the required 
side yard setbacks would be a minimum of four feet with the sum of the side yards not less than 10 feet. So those are the exceptions for small lots in the residential district, which are generally, you know, less than 75 feet wide. Um, obviously, this is, you know, less than half that width. Um, the property and surrounding area uh, will be evaluated at a later date for a potential mass rezoning as part of the city's comprehensive review and rezoning of residentially used properties that are currently zoned business. We've done that through um, several years. We have done taken sections of the city and have done that. Uh, we anticipate that this area and the historic districts would be reviewed in the spring of 23. Uh, the City of Stanton Comprehensive Plan designates this area as neighborhood residential. Um, and one of the policies um, in this uh, district is to encourage the development of infill housing units that are compatible with existing facilities and structures. Um, this application is um, compatible with the Comprehensive Plan and the neighboring uses. The Plan Commission conducted a public hearing on August 18th, 2012. And at the conclusion of that public hearing where no one spoke in opposition to the request, the commission voted four to zero to one to recommend, uh, recommend approval of special use permit with the following conditions. One, all setbacks and lot area requirements shall be the same as a single family dwelling on existing small lot in the R4 district and all provisions of chapter 18.120. And number two, use of the property shall be limited to one single family dwelling and accessory uses. I'd be glad to take any questions that council has at this time or after you conduct the public hearing. Are there any questions by council members? So the vote was not unanimous by the planning commission. It was four to zero with one member abstaining. Abstaining. Okay. All right. Mr. Rhodes, this is Brenda Mead. Councilor Mead. Uh, how many other uh, how many other vacant lots are in this area? I guess within a block or two, because um, it, it seems to me there look it looks like there are other vacant lots, and will this stimulate redevelopment of those lots as well? Do you think? Um, well, Habitat has been redeveloping a lot of those lots in that area. Um, in this particular block, I believe it's the only one that's vacant. But yeah, there certainly are other lots in the, in the vicinity. Thank you. Any additional questions? Okay, so this is a public hearing. I'm going to read uh, the statement that um, Mr. Blair has me read concerning public um, hearings. In a moment, I will open up the public hearing. It is a time that council sets aside to hear from citizens and others about a specific topic. We ask that you please give your name, your address, and then keep your remarks at five minutes or less. When you reach the five-minute time limit, I will let you know that your time limit has expired. For our Zoom participants, please raise your hand now if you wish to speak on this particular public hearing. If you raise your hand during the public hearing, you will also be able to raise your hand during the council meeting for other public hearings and matters of the public. And please keep your comments to five minutes as well. Once everyone who wishes to speak has had an opportunity, I will then close the public hearing. I will now open the public hearing, so if you wish to speak, please approach the podium, and we'll alternate between individuals physically present and those that have their hand raised via the Zoom platform. So I will um, ask a citizen from um, any one of you um, from the audience to come and speak if you would like to address the City Council concerning this matter, and then we'll go to the folks on Zoom, and we'll just alternate back and forth. If you can come to the podium, uh, five minutes is your time limit if you can give your name and your address. Um, I'll hit the gavel now. That'll open it up. And when I hit the gavel a second time, that'll close the public hearing out. So with that, the public hearing is now officially open. Would anyone care to address the city council? Welcome, Mr. Arrowwood. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, members of council. Uh, my name is Brad Arrowwood. I'm Chief Operations Officer for Habitat for Humanity, uh, for Stanton, Augusta, Waynesboro, Habitat for Humanity. Um, and we are the ones putting forward the special use permit. Uh, it's, it was kind of a surprise to me to find out that this neighborhood, if you've ever seen Anderson Street, it's this little loop of houses, and most of them are over 100 years old, and they've been there this whole time, um, to find out that many of the lots there are zone B1. 
Um, so I had to get a special use permit to put a house in this existing neighborhood. Um, it, now we are able to meet all of the uh, traditional setbacks for the, uh, the small uh, lot uh, setbacks on that as well. Um, and Valley Votec is in fact building this house uh, for us as a project for their oh, students okay. as well. Uh, and we'll be uh, setting this sort of as modules in there. And we, we intend to, uh, this is so close to the historic districts in a couple directions that we, we try to have our, our houses blend in uh, with the historic districts as well, just so they don't detract from the neighborhoods they go into. Um, we have a, a family uh, already going through our program uh, to be uh, in this house as well, uh, too. So we try to add to a neighborhood. Uh, we're trying to do more infill uh, in uh, within Stanton uh, limits as well. And, and um, as Mr. Rose pointed out, we have been very active in this area on Heidenreich and Stafford Streets. Um, you, probably seen these and been been down there as well we think those are very nice houses uh, a blend of uh, modular stick build um votech built one of those houses for us as well so that's become a good partnership uh, for us and i'm just here to see if you uh, have any questions uh for me on this project or any concerns anything what brad when when do you uh if is this approved when do you think this will be done well um Let's see. Yeah, oh, hey, there's our director, Lance Barton. Um, we would like to move quickly on uh, getting I'm, – I'm trying to get temporary power in there as fast as I can. Uh, Ted Kahn, uh, who is a, uh, does concrete uh, foundations and, and footers on that, has donated uh, his work as well on this. We'd like to get that going as quickly as possible um, because – once the snow starts flying, things get a little bit dicey uh, for that. So we'd like to move as, as fast as possible to get family in there. Um, but it, it's, you know, there are vagaries within the construction industry on that. So we'll do the best we can to move I as quickly understand. as possible. So don't nail me down to a certain time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Brad. We appreciate the comments. Um, just real quick, does anyone else have any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Ms. Cormier, does anyone have their hands raised in the Zoom? Zach says no. Yeah. Okay. Zach says no. Zach said, oh, are yes. you in control of it, Zach? Okay, no. All right. Uh, would anyone else from the audience care to address? Come on up, Mr. Fawcett. My name is Albino Fossa. I live at 401 Bowling Street in Stanton. I have a pair of new hearing aids, thanks to the Army, finally. Right. Okay, so that's no problem. All right, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. Okay, but that's neither here nor there. I would like to say this. Habitat for Humanity always does very, very good things for a lot of people. And you have certain rules and regulations with respect to business and business positions. But all of those rules are just for years and years ago. They're not for today. Today is a different time. Today, you have to take each case individually and try to do the best you can for the, those people who don't have an opportunity or don't have the money to live comfortably. Okay, uh, myself, I have more than enough, but for some people, very little. I would hope that you would take the opportunity and support as much as possible Habitat for, for the humanity people and give them what they want and what is best for the people who need it. There's too many rentals going on in this city. Too many, too many. And their prices are outrageous. Habitat keeps it in control. Try to support it. I hope you will. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Zach. No. All right. Um, anyone else in the audience that would care to address the city council? Come on, Lance. <laughs> Last chance. All right. With that, the public hearing is now closed. I will entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. 
Councillor Classy. I move the council adopt the resolution and approve the special use permit with the conditions as recommended by the Planning Commission. Right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I will second that. All right. We have a second. Any further discussion? Um, I'll have to say that I really thought that this was a residential area anyway um, with Anderson Street. So I will definitely be supporting this motion. And with that, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Stahl. Aye. The motion carries. All right. Thank you. <laughs> there you go, Lance. <laughs> All right, the next item is item B, a consideration of resolution for donation of fire apparatus to Letcher Volunteer Fire and Rescue Squad Incorporated. Mr. Blair. Thank you, Mayor Oaks and Council. Um, this is one of those items where, as we know, in Stanton, uh, 2020, there was flooding here and other localities reached out to help the city of Stanton at that time. Uh, this, this is a very similar situation and an opportunity uh, as staff use it to assist another locality that's uh, struggled from recent flooding. As you may know, in late July through August 1st, uh, there was significant flooding out in Tennessee and uh, Southwest Virginia. And the, uh, as you may have seen in your packet, uh, there was a call um, to Virginia fire departments um, in which a number of the fire and rescue services in the flooded area had lost equipment and um, were struggling and still are struggling to recover from the flood. Uh, the city had a fire apparatus on gov deals as we do with our surplus property. It was a 1996 fire truck or fire engine. Um, Chief Garber, when he saw this call, uh, worked with Chad Horvat in procurement and they pulled this uh, fire truck from gov deals and thought they would present it to council tonight. Um, the agency that you would be potentially transferring this item to is called uh, the Letcher Volunteer Fire and Rescue Squad. They're located in Jasper, Kentucky. Um, again, this is a 1996 truck that the city of Stanton had already declared or had already decided was surplus property and was trying to sell on gov deals. Um, tonight, before you is a resolution in which you as the council can declare it surplus and donate it to the Letcher Fire and Rescue Service. Right. Are there any questions? This is Brenda Mead. Councillor Mead. What's the estimated value of this property? Uh, I believe the estimated value, the highest bid was $4,250, but I think the estimated value, and, and I'm sorry, um, I don't have that number in front of me, but I believe when staff was talking about this was between four and $5,000. Thank you. All right. Any additional questions? No. Well, I'm glad that um, we have the opportunity to be able to help our neighbors uh, further south. So, all right. With that, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Go ahead. Go ahead. Councilor Amy Darby. I move that council adopt the proposed resolution to declare a fire apparatus as surplus property and to donate the fire apparatus to the Letcher Volunteer Fire and Rescue Squad Incorporated. Right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'm at, Madam Mayor. I'll second that. All right. Vice Mayor Robertson is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Mr. Classy? Aye. Ms. Dahl? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Mead? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. All right. Item C is a consideration of resolution for the benefit of Shenandoah Valley Regional Airport Commission. Mr. Blair. Good evening, Mayor Oaks and Council. I will introduce our Commissioner of Revenue, 
Maggie Reagan, but tonight she appears before you as our city appointee to the Shenandoah Valley Regional Airport Board, or Regional Airport Authority. Good to see you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. Um, as Mr. Blair stated, I'm here with my airport hat on this evening. Um, and as you all know, the five jurisdictions that make up the commission, Harrisonburg, Stanton, Waynesboro, Rockingham, and Augusta, um, come before bo each of our boards um, anytime we are intending to uh, encumber the commission with debt. And back in 2019, um, you all adopted resolutions to uh, support the um, the loan that we took out to support the North Corporate Hangar Project. That's the project that we presented to you about a month ago. And since that project is still in the works and still being completed, we need to extend the terms of that loan. So Blue Ridge Bank has offered us a one-year extension that would run from October 22 to October 23. And I am here to ask that you all vote in, in support of um, a resolution allowing that extension on that loan. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have at this time. Are there any questions? No? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Councilor Claffey. I move to adopt the proposed resolution for the benefit of Shenandoah Valley Regional Airport Commission approving and authorizing the commissioner's incurrence of debt to finance its project. All is described in the resolution. All right. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks, I'll second that. Councilor Amy Darby has second. Any further discussion? I'm hearing none. Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Ms. Dahl? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Mead? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that takes us to item D, a consideration of ordinance to amend the FY 2022 budget ordinance for the city of Stanton by adding budget amendment number five. Mr. Blair. Uh, thank you, Mayor Oaks. Our interim chief financial officer, Jesse Moyers, will be presenting this item. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Mayor, members of council, um, this is the fifth budget amendment for FY22. It was introduced at the July 28th meeting, and I'm now bringing it back to you for your consideration tonight. As a reminder, budget amendment number five is the appropriation of additional $318,280 for the Virginia Community Ready Sites Program Grant. This is a grant that the city received for the Stanton Crossing. This particular grant was introduced at the May 26th meeting and subsequently approved at the June 9th meeting for $532,500. This figure was based on early estimates and the actual grant is $850,780. The additional funds are allocated as follows, 7280 for the general fund to support a traffic impact study, $85,000 for the CIP fund to support a land survey, $21,750 for the water fund for additional funds for the water system design work, $135,750 for the sewer fund for additional funds for the wastewater um, design work, $34,000 for the stormwater fund to support preliminary stormwater and floodplain studies, and $34,500 for the environmental fund to support phase one environmental services. All right. Are there any questions? Okay. Hey, I'll entertain a motion. This is Carolyn Dahl. Councillor Dahl. I move to adopt an ordinance amending the fiscal year 2022 budget by adding budget amendment number five, totaling $318,280. All right. There's a motion on the floor by Councillor Dahl. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I'll second. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Dahl? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> All right, the next item is item E, a consideration of ordinance to amend the FY 2023 budget 
ordinance for the city of Stanton by adding budget amendment number one. Mr. Blair. Thank you, Mayor Oaks. Again, we will turn to the city's interim, interim chief financial officer, Jesse Moyers. All right. The first budget amendment for the 23 fiscal year was introduced July 28th for $282,500. The amendment is to appropriate additional American Rescue Plan Fund Act. I'm bringing it, bringing it back to you tonight for your consideration. The following items are being presented to you this evening. Uh, $100,000 for the general fund, and this is for the West End Small Area Plan. plan. $107,500 for the CIP fund, and this is for the Stanton Crossing Marketing Plan. $75,000 for the water fund for the Uniontown Comprehensive Plan and Small Area Study. There are no school amendments in this, um, the first amendment of 23. Great. Right. Are there any questions? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Mayor Oaks. Councilor Amy Dorby. I move to adopt an ordinance amending the fiscal year 2023 budget by adding budget amendment number one, totaling $282,500. All right. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. And Councilor Claffey is second. Any further discussion? Yes, this is Brenda Mead. Councilor Mead. I think this is, these uh, uh, budget amendments represent a real positive step forward for the city in, in the way we use the ARPA funds. These are non-recurring funds, and we're putting them to good use at uh, developing plans for Stanton Crossing, for the West End, and for Uniontown. So I'm going to support it. All right. Any additional comments or questions? All right. Hearing none, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Mead? Aye. Mayor Claffey? Aye. Ms. Stahl? Aye. The motion carries. All right. Thank you. Don't go anywhere, Jesse. <laughs> All right. Item F is a consideration of a memorandum of understanding for an operational funding formula for Stanton City Schools. Mr. Blair? Thank you, Mayor Oaks. And again, I'd like to thank our Interim Chief Financial Officer, Jesse Moyers, and she'll be presenting this item. Thank you. The Memorandum of Understanding for the Stanton City Schools Operational Funding Formula outlines the agreed-upon framework for the city and the schools for the calculation of the local funding um, for the schools. The proposed funding formula uses audited financial data from the annual Consolidated Financial Report. The use of audited financial data will allow for more predictable calculation based on actual data instead of budget figures, which could be subjective. Specifics on the formula have been outlined in the MOU and the supporting funding calculation that was included in your agenda packet. Fiscal year 2020 was used as the baseline year, meaning the calculated figure using the proposed formula equaled the total local funding contribution budgeted for that fiscal year for schools. In accordance with Virginia law, the MOU does not bind future city councils or school boards to a particular funding request or appropriation. The MOU will be reviewed on an annual basis by June 30th by city and school staff. Once the MOU is signed by council, the new funding formula will be used to calculate the FY24 baseline local contribution to the schools. Are there any questions? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move to council approve the proposed memorandum of understanding for the operational funding formula for Stanton City Schools as presented. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks, I'll second. Right. Councilor Amy Darby has second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Mead? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Stahl? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That takes us to item G, a consideration of resolution ending declaration of local emergency beginning July 6, 2022. Mr. Blair. 
Thank you, Mayor Oaks. Um, as everyone recalls, on July 6th of this year, Stanton had a microburst uh, situation in which a number of trees were, uh, I, I guess, uprooted, and there was additional damage, including uh, damage to some city facilities at Gypsy Hill Park. Um, based on the damage, the interim city manager, Leslie Beauregard, retroactively declared an emergency. At your July 28th meeting, the city council uh, ratified that declaration of emergency. And on August 4th of this year, the city received uh, some communication from the state's Department of Emergency Management advising that we could end the declaration of emergency. And so before you tonight is a resolution which would effectively end, well, it wouldn't effectively, it would end the declaration of emergency that was retroactive to July 6, 2022 for the microburst uh, incident. Are there any questions? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move to adopt the resolution ending the declaration of a local emergency beginning July 6th, 2022 in the city of Stanton. All right. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor, I'll second that. Right, Councillor Claffey has second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Cormier, please call the roll. Ms. Mead? Aye. Ms. Stahl? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. The motion carries. All right. Thank you. That takes us on to matters from the acting interim city manager, <laughs> Mr. Blair. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Mayor Oaks. Um, three very quick items. First, uh, Ms. Beauregard was unable to attend tonight due to illness, so we wish her the best in her recovery. Uh, second, as you may recall, at the last council meeting, uh, there was a zoning text amendment for solar facilities within the city. And at that uh, meeting, the applicant mentioned a revenue provision in the code of Virginia that the city could enact uh, based on megawattage. It's a certain amount of money per megawatt produced by solar facilities. Uh, Councilor Dole at that time expressed some interest in seeing a proposal. Um, since then, I spoke with our commissioner of the revenue, Maggie Reagan, and Maggie and I had to talk about this, and she reached out to other commissioners. And her advice to the council, and, and I fully would agree with this, is we should wait because while the megawatt provision does provide revenue, it also can preclude your collection of machinery and tools tax. And it's her advice, again, and I agree with this, Given that we're probably not going to see very many of these proposals in the city limits, perhaps just one, that she would like to see an actual proposal before coming back with an ordinance to the council for either the megawatt or perhaps her recommendation may not even be an ordinance. It may be to collect property and machinery and tools tax. She said she'd need to see the proposal before she could give you good advice on which is the proper or the, the mo I guess, the maximization of the revenue that you might get from a solar farm. And then finally, uh, this morning at the Economic Development Authority meeting, uh, just wanted to congratulate Allison Denby was elected the chair of that body this morning. Congratulations to Allison. All right. With that, that takes us to matters from the public. This part of City Council's agenda is entitled Matters from the Public. It is a time that Council sets aside to hear from citizens and others about a wide variety of subjects. A copy of the Stanton City Council's Matters from the Public rules are available in paper form at the clerk's desk and online on the City of Stanton's webpage. You are asked to familiarize yourself with those rules before commenting. Please come to the podium or begin your call, identify yourself, and complete your remarks within five minutes. So once again, we'll alternate between the citizens 
um, that are here in person and the folks that have their hands raised in the Zoom. And we'll just go back and forth. So with that, the matters from the public is now open. Um, Mr. Fossa. <laughs> Seems that uh, tonight it was a very interesting and very calm and peaceful meeting, and I thank you for that. However, there are some things that I'm still concerned about, and there doesn't seem to be any results resolution for them. My memory comes and it skips, comes and it skips. Okay. First of all, I think you should really reconsider your salaries. That's the first thing. I don't think you're getting paid enough for all of the <laughs> problems that you have. That's the first thing. I don't think ten thousand dollars is enough. Enough. It should be at least double that, whether you like it or don't like it. Then you'll have some people who will want to run for council for all of that money. And that will be a problem. The pr next thing is this. This council is controlled by four people. Each of you, and they, there are three others who also belong on this council. And they were also elected by people to be represented for these people, government of the people, by the people and for the people. And when you have just a majority of four who are a small clique, and that's, don't get upset about that because that's the truth. It's a clique. Okay. That puts those three people out. They're not getting proper representation or proper help or proper well, I don't have all of the words, but you all understand what I'm talking about. Instead of having that kind of situation, when you have a problem where people, where some people are going to be opposed to you, then that problem should be taken care of differently than just be voted by four people. It should go back to, to the meeting and it should be fought out again over and over again until you compromise to an appropriate decision so that those people who are vehement about their decisions are being given an opportunity to participate in government by this council. Otherwise, they're nothing more than figureheads. I hope you all understand that, what I'm saying. So I ask you to think about that. You're not going to have controversial situations, but when you have controversial situations, it should be more than just four people. You've got seven people on the council, and there should be a compromise so that those people don't feel that they're being kicked out or left out. They represent a portion of the population stand. The next thing, of course, you all understand that the head of the real estate department gets more money than all of you combined. And when I had a meeting with him once before, he said to me, it doesn't matter whether your house is next to a chicken coop or whether it's next to a pig farm or whether it's next to a railroad. And that's wrong. That's terribly wrong. Because the first thing that somebody, when they buy a house, the first thing they look for is location, location, location. And the location should have some kind of effect on the value of a house. When you have four or five, sometimes six heavy diesel engines going past your house, which is only probably less than 13 feet away from the railroad, and you have about a mile or two miles of railroad cars, and they go through all hours of the day, there's got to be something. 
It's not, I'm not questioning about paying the bill. I'm questioning about the situation. That's all. I can well afford to pay. Okay? And I want you to think about that. Right. Your time is up. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Corm- um, Ms. Cormier, do we have anyone with their hands raised? Oh, that's right. Zach, I'm so used to. No, nobody? Got it. All right. Would anyone else in the audience care to address the council? Uh, Members of the council, uh, members of the audience. Um, My name is Leslie Kipp. I live at 16 Church Street. Just a few comments on what was just said. Um, I don't agree with everything this council has done, but I will say this as a um, observer of Stanton politics. One of the things I've noticed that since the last election, there is a group that have basically refused to uh, recognize the legitimacy of the people who won. One of the key elements in a democracy is one we agree to be uh, abide by um, the rule of the majority, and sometimes that's people or they come up with uh, resolutions, ideas that we don't like. That's part of democracy because if you wait a long enough time uh, until the next election cycle, you can possibly vote them out. Um, and it's the fact that we haven't recognized this idea of reciprocity the the idea is just uh withering away in this country uh someone wins an election we say it's fraud someone wins an election we say we don't recognize them as a legitimate winner well we have to get over that um and the idea for a democracy is reciprocity um, you trust that the other side that wins will not go too far and take away your rights because come next election cycle, you may um, seek revenge and they have to trust that they that you won't go too far. Again, the idea is reciprocity. It's a idea that we do not have mutually assured destruction of the other side. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Zach, we have one. All right. Can, can you fix the clock? Yeah, thank you. Caller, you may begin. Hi, this is Yvonne Wilson, 2017 First Street here in Stanton. First, for some positive uh, announcements, I have had the pleasure of uh, being with the Stanton West End Business Association with their quarterly trash pickup on August the 13th. That was amazing. Um, shout out to Julia Sheets as well as Vicki Parkinson and Aaron Danner who were there. I, it was a great time and these people are the kind of people that we need to listen to as far as taking care of our city. I've also had the pleasure of attending the 50th anniversary of Montgomery Hall Park and again, Speaking with a lot of the residents of Stanton, there were uh, some people that were from the county as well, but mostly Stanton residents. And, you know, you really do get a different perspective when you speak with people who actually live or are on the ground. And they want to see the same things that I want to see in the city of Stanton, especially when it comes to economic revitalization and walkable parks and again someone brought up just yesterday to me an email saying that you know i don't understand why stanton doesn't have a taxi service or an uber service or a lift because there's a lot of people 
and I'm one of them that is struggling with uh, transportation, public transportation. A lot of us have to carpool or depend on other people, so we definitely need to tighten that up here in the city. I also want to discuss an article that I have noticed in the Augusta Free Press, and it was talking about how the Stanton Visioning Coalition is aiming to have an impact on the fall city council and school board elections in the Queen City. It has said that they are all about openness. Of course, they will be active. And their goal is to continue to be supporting candidates who have the best interests of Stanton in mind. I doubt that. And I'm going to tell you why. There are things that are going on in this city that you all do not know about, that you guys don't understand, but I get it every day. I've gone out and I've campaigned and I've given cards to people and I let them know what my platform is. And once I tell them that I am a conservative, there are certain things that come out of their mouths in this city of Stanton that if it was the other way around, it would have made it to the news leader, it would have made it to WHSB, it would have made it to whatever. You know what I get asked? I get asked, how can you be black and vote Republican? How can you be black and vote the way you vote? And, of course, I have to say, what does that have to do with what I'm trying to do for the city of Stanton? And there are certain people, like some people in the Stanton Visioning Coalition, that foment those type of sentiments. Those sentiments are in the city right now. Some of you may not believe it, and that's fine. You don't have to take my word for it. I'm here to run as a city council member because I care what goes on in my city. And when you have organizations that project a certain narrative and have people think a certain way that is divisive, that is racist, I already called out on some racism at the last meeting, and I'm not afraid to do it again. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to call it out each and every time. Show me that you are about the vision of Stanton being inclusive and diverse. Because right now you're not showing it to me, and you're not showing it to certain other candidates. Caller, your time is Stop up. Stop lying. Caller, your time is up. All right, would anyone else? Uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Cindy Connors. I live at 106A Skyline Avenue. And I will not directly uh, address the inflammatory comments of the last caller about the Stanton Visioning Coalition, but I am one of the seven members of the steering committee, and we are a coalition of folks that live in Stanton that have exactly the same right to endorse, support, walk for, uh, support candidates in the race, as does um, the previous caller to run for office. Um, and we have a email address. It's stantonvisioningcoalition at gmail.com. If anybody has any questions about us, we're happy to answer them. Our events have been public, and we do not stand for any of the racist, etc. things we were just accused of. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right. One last time, Zach. Do we have anyone? No, no hands raised. Okay. Would anyone else from the audience care to address the council? Great. Hearing none. As mayor of the city of Stanton, I call the August 25th, 2022 meeting adjourned.